Welcome, Professor Ian Pierce from St. Paul's Eye Unit uh, in Manchester and uh, consultant ophthalmologist and vitro retinal surgeon at St. Paul's, as I just said, providing specialist services for AMD, vitro retinal surgery, diabetic diseases, uveitis, and cataract surgery, surgery. And he's as well director of Northwest Eye Care Consultancy in the Spire Liverpool Hospital. His talk is going to be the power of an EMR in research, local, regional, and national benefits. Hello, Ian. Hi, Stefan. Thank you very much for that kind invitation. I'm just waiting for my slides to come up. I promise they come. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. And so, yeah, so I'm, I'm the director of the Clinical Eye Research Centre in Liverpool. I live in Manchester, uh, but I'm actually uh, based in Liverpool. I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we've used electronic or medical records um, in research in our Clinical Eye Research Centre. Now, these are my disclosures. The relevant ones here are up for Heidelberg uh, and some of the imaging and modalities we use. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the landscape of um, electronic medical records in the UK. And then I'm going to go on about its use of these records for both research, both for an individual patient benefit, on a unit benefit, and then run these out further to how you can use these electronic or medical records for uh, helping you in your local research and maybe regional and national research and, and international research, as Oliver's already alluded to earlier on. But the key message from my talk will be that if you're using an electronic or medical record, that start using the audit tool right from the beginning. I noticed when Oliver was giving his fantastic presentation at the beginning of this session, he mentioned that, oh, that after a year, we're going to use the auditing tool and start looking at what data we can get out of the record. And my advice is to do that from almost from the first week. And the reason for that is, is that once you start using the auditing tool, you can actually find um, where your mistakes are. You can say, oh, well, if I'd only collected that data in a structured manner, then that would have been helpful. An example might be if you're looking at a patient with uveitis and you want to find out sarcoid, how many of them are related to sarcoid. Well, unless you've put sarcoid down in a structured way, then it'll be lost in the free text and you won't be able to capture that data. And you don't want to find that out a year down the line. You want to find that out at the beginning. So that's really what they're going to be the key message is start using that audit tool from the beginning. You will be amazed the information you can get for it. It really drives your passion. But most importantly, it makes sure that you use the medical record um, in, in the best way from, from the beginning, because once bad habits are there, the more difficult to get rid of. Um, so a little bit of the background, we all know medical electronic medical records been around since the 60s, but really didn't start taking off. Even at the beginning of the 2000s, nothing actually happened really. There was a few units using it in isolated cases. And then from about 2008, things started to take off. And this has partly been driven, particularly in the US, uh, because of some changes that the, the new government, the, the uh, Barack Obama's government brought in in about 2009 which helps some of the funding because one of the issues with it is there's a capital outlay in buying the medical records and then there's all the change issues that occur but there was a big impulse around um, about 2009 in the US and you can see here from the data how much that has driven in between 2008 and 2015 only in seven years the change up to nearly 96 percent of US hospitals using these electronic medical records. Now, so what are what were the main functions there? You, a lot of the original uh, uh, drives for it have been around patient admin, so for billing and making sure that uh, patient clinic visits are booked at the right time, etc. So those administrative things are sometimes the initial drivers. But the what there are other benefits in terms of communication. You can link the electronic medical record to pharmacy, etc. It can produce a patient uh, information letter to the primary physician, etc. And all these things are significant advantages. Can help in decision support. Um, so some of the EMRs will build in. Uh, uh, decision aids to try and say, well, have you thought about this or would you consider this at this stage? And this is something that needs a lot more work on. Um, uh, but that's certainly something that for the future. But the thing I'm going to concentrate on is the research and reporting element. And this is becoming particularly important for payers and for um, um, different regions and governments for looking at key quality indicators. And that's been certainly the drive in the UK 
we've already heard earlier on, I think Anthony mentioned the National Ophthalmic Database in the UK. So this is from the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. I've had this in drive to have a national collection of the de- uh, of uh, cataract audit data. Now, we've not got complete coverage at the moment, but in this last year's um, uh, audit, we've now collected in a structured way 240,000 uh, 240, cataract surgeries in a single year from 2,000 surgeons and 100 centres. Now, Adam and Tufnail is going to talk about some of the big data that can come from databases like this. The reason I brought this up is because in the UK, out of those 101 centres, 89 of them are using a single EMR, um, and that's Medisoft or Medisite in, in its latest guise. Um, a few of the units are using open eyes. This is a Morefields developed EMR, and it's an excellent um, EMR, and it does link in with the Medisoft data in terms of similar collection um, of data, and, that, and that's critical, and that's part of the way it was developed. Uh, but it's certainly you can see from here that, that Medisoft is leading the way in the UK, uh, and as you've seen from Oliver now, spreading out more internationally, and this, this can be very, very powerful because you can bring these databases together. Uh, so in the UK as a whole, though, when you bring the electronic medical record into a unit, not all clinician, clinicians use it. And this is one of the challenges in the individual units. There are people who uh, struggle with the change, and it is difficult, the initial change. But once you've got over that initial hurdle of the first few weeks, then things become easier and easier. And as Oliver said, then it's more difficult to go back to anything else. But you can see here that this is a data about five years out of date now. But certainly in the UK, a 48 unit survey, only about a third of all clinicians in the unit were using it and two thirds weren't. And this you found was in certain um, disease specialities. So medical retina, most of the units um, were actually using it. If you, if, if, you know, most of the medical retina physicians were using it and also glaucoma. So a lot of the research output from the big data sets will come from medical retina and glaucoma. But gradually, we hope that the cornea, ocular plastics, paediatrics will see the benefit and certainly bring that into their own practice because the outcomes that we can get uh, outweigh any of the initial problems with the change process. So in my own personal experience, we've been using um, Medisoft um, or Medisite as it is now, electronic medical records in our unit for the past three years. I was one of those clinicians that took it across the whole of my service. So I've had all cases, all encounters um, collected over that three year period. And gradually now over the last three months, the whole department is using this as our EMR and not using any paper at all. And, that, and that's been a real significant change. Uh, and this is that landing page that Oliver mentioned. You, when you open up a, a particular patient record, and these details are, are, are fictitious, so don't worry, these are from the uh, Medisoft's own website. Uh, but you're, you're faced with this, and this just gives you the, the background information with regards to past medical history and current medication and what the vision charts are doing for the individual patient. And we're using that electronic medical record and linking um, in with the digital imaging that we're using. And remember, when I started to, over 20 years ago as a um, consultant in our unit, we didn't have OCT, but as now ubiquitous, your OCT, more recently OCT and geography, and linking that with the electronic or medical record. For an individual patient, you can get a readout such as this. So here you've got, um, this is the uh, injection uh, frequency and the type of injection. So this patient was re- for their classic type two CMV, was receiving Lucentis injections, and they started with a loading dose of three monthly injections. And you can see here how the vision improved, and then we extended this visit out to maybe about six uh, weeks, and we were able to maintain the vision over this period. But the green dots here are the central foveal thickness that can be collected and brought in as the raw data into the EMR. And you can see as the vision goes up, the uh, CF central foveal thickness uh, it's reducing and maintaining at a low level. Um, and you can see here that for individual patient on a single shot, you can see that we're maintaining the visual acuity whilst we're extending these visits further on down the line. So the electronic medical record for an individual patient can tell a lot with a single graphical interface. And this is critical when you're seeing patients. It does speed up uh, assessment very quickly for these patients. But as I said, that's not the key button. The button Next to the home button here is the audit button. And I would really urge that you start using this as soon as you can. When you push this button, there are already 
predefined audits in there. Uh, and, and again, Oliver showed some of those, um, but some of them, um, just to, to just highlight a few of them, this is an operation summary. Now, remember, as I say, in my unit, we've been using it for three years, but only a few clinicians, and now gradually we've run it out to everybody else. We can see here we've got over 60,000 operations recorded now. Now, a lot of those are intravitreal injections, but there's over seven, uh, over 6,000 cataract operations and over 2,500 vitreal retinal procedures. And that's very, very important. This will build and build and build as more and more clinicians are on board with it. But you can look into the operation um, uh, complication uh, audit tool just by the click of a button. And here you can see 10 patients with inadvertent subretinal fluid drainage during buckling surgery. Now, the beauty of this is you can then click on this box and this will give you the individual patients and the surgeon, the surgeon details. So you can identify if a particular surgeon is having a particular complication. And this is helpful not only for them to identify and benchmark themselves, but also to be able to identify with a unit and make sure there's good governance for this. And people sometimes fear about this, but I think the, the issue is, is that you know 98% of patients, uh, patients' operations don't have any complication interoperatively, and there are only a handful that do, and this can be helpful to identify them. So on an individual unit audit, that can be helpful. And we can see here for macular hole surgery, um, this bubble chart here will show that, uh, that patients, the biggest group of patients we see here are patients who present roughly with uh, 2200 vision and end up somewhere between 2040 and 2060 vision. And again, it can be particularly useful, but also you can identify those patients who do particularly bad. And you, by clicking on any one of these individual bubbles, you'll be able to identify those patients and look more critically at their cases. So that can be very, very helpful on an individual basis. But how will it help you going forward? You've got the audit data. How does it help you going forward into uh, studies? Well, you may wish to recruit patients for a study. So this is a shape discrimination tool that we use, a handheld uh, iPhone app. Um, to identify patients with early macular degeneration or early diabetic macular edema changes by their inability to discriminate between the, the shape here and the circle. Now, they've, we've used this in our university department, both in AMD and diabetics, which are very easy, but they now want to run it out into vitreal macular traction patients. So how do you identify those? Do you wait until they come through the door? No, you go to the audit tool, you click on your uh, diagnostic list and you can see all the, the categories we've got here. But within each of these categories, you can pick out. And here we can identify our 190 patients within our database with vitreal macular attraction. And we can then interrogate that database and say, right, tell me when their next appointment is so that we can identify them. So uh, that's one example. Here's another example. This is a, a study we're involved with for diabetic macular edema. So patients with diabetic macular edema treated with anti-VEGF are being randomised to either continued anti-VEGF or early vitrectomy and continued anti-VEGF. So how do you identify those patients? Do you wait until your colleague remembers that that patient, oh, they may be suitable for this study? No, you can set up a standard audit within the uh, electronic medical records and you can say, well, I want to identify all patients who had three injections um, in the last three months who are treatment naive, but still have a central foveal thickness greater than 340 microns. And by setting up that customized order, and you can do this with um, Medisoft and say to them, look, I want you to do that particular order. Can you supply that for me for my individual unit? And they can do. And that order at the push of the button will identify a number of patients. I've taken out their unit numbers here but it will identify that these patients have had three injections, this is their last injection day, that they were treatment naive for diabetic macular edema, and this is their next planned visit. So I can tell my study coordinator nurse to say, look, uh, on this day, will you make sure you identify that patient and um, make sure you let us know and we can consider recruiting them for this, uh, for this particular study. And this is really powerful for recruitment. It's one of the challenges in all studies. Now, we can use it in multi-centre trials. Uh, this is where, because as I said, 89 units around the country have um, uh, Medisoft already uh, available there. So you can now ask those individual units to provide an, uh, anonymized, um, anonymized data 
and we do that in the UK through a thing called the Go uh, Calder Got Guardian. But basically, that will be an individual within the institute who will allow that anonymized data to come out, and we can collect that. And we did this for Ozidex for diabetic macular edema and retinal vein occlusion. And I can't present the results yet because this is still under investigation at the moment. But effectively, we've been able to identify over 2,000 eyes treated for those indications with Ozidex. And after cleaning for predefined inclusion exclusion criteria, you can identify a significant number of patients. And you just can't do this without this collective uh, EMR database. And there are large national data sets you can do this. Adnan's going to speak about the data sets, and I'm sure he's going to draw reference to the UK EMR uh, database, which he's led uh, with 16 units around the country. And, and, and this, I've just picked out one of these because I think this, this, this large data set can provide us with valuable information. This is from a paper from that group showing that patients who had not had treatment with anti-VEGF for over 12 months, by 12 months later, about a third of them have developed reactivation of the CMV. And this is critical for our understanding of how we manage those patients going forward when they seem to be stable. What do we do? How do we monitor them? Should we monitor them at all? Should we continue treatment? This sort of made large data set is critical in our understanding of the disease. So I think what I've shown you is that it, the benefits of EMR, it's available now. This is not science fiction, this is available now. You can do individual audits on your own department, that's fine. But for research, specifically for recruitment, it can be very, very powerful. You can set up those customized audits, find out when patients are coming, you can need it. And it can help inform you on prospective studies, what sort of things and data, critical data you will need. I've not touched on the problems. There are lots of problems. Individual patient consent, how to data capture and validity, the different system heterogeneity. But what I think I've tried to show you is that what you can do by having a system, certainly in a UK where we were predominantly using one type of system, a lot of this can be helped. But if you use that audit button from the beginning, you will make sure that the validity, you'll know what's valid for you, for your own individual research. And you know, I'll make sure that piece of data is included at every visit. And that will help your team development. And that's really that key message is use that audit button from the beginning. Please get involved with that and you'll make sure you collect the correct data. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for the kind invite. Over to yourself. Um, thank you very much um, for this excellent talk. And uh, we have time for, for one question I would like uh, to pick up, which is actually not related to ophthalmology, but um, uh, someone asks, uh, is there potential or shouldn't for the decision-making, you mentioned the decision-making process uh, for healthcare is people or politicians even, wouldn't that be uh, the ideal tool to manage things such as COVID or other uh, uh, diseases? Um, would there be a better decision-making possible if, as you say, you start from scratch to, to get that data? Maybe you can comment how that could be applied in that situation. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. It's, it's a, I think the decision support aids are lagging behind the curve at the moment. I think you, for an example like COVID, what you could do is by having the EMR data, you could identify those risk factors at an early stage and you could then build into the program, say, if a patient comes in with risk factor A, B and C, then I would give them treatment Y. But that takes time and, and I think we, we're not at that stage at the moment. It's one of the, the disappointing things we've seen, I think, with the EMRs is that they're a little bit crude, the decision aids at the moment, but we're all learning about it. You've seen that it's only been the last decade that this has taken off. But what I think now we're getting to that critical level where so many units are using, we've got to start working together, looking at this, this critical topic to how to collect that data and how to go forward for things that might help in the future, such as a further pandemic. And, and I think when it leads on nicely to Adnan's talk next, because I think the big data that we're collecting from this is not just numbers, it's not just fancy graphs, it's how we manage medicine, how we um, manage patients better going forward. So I, I think it's a powerful tool, and, and I think I'm as passionate as Oliver and as I'm as passionate as Adnan as this. This is the way forward for us. Yeah, thank you, Ian, uh, for this comment. And you mentioned Adnan a couple of times, but I don't want to let you go before before telling again everybody you live in uh, Manchester and you work in Liverpool. I hope this is correct. Sorry uh, for the for the small error. Okay, so thank you again, and we now uh, move on. Uh, we are